you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture this morning. And I may even have you help me out. But we're going to start in Matthew chapter 2. There was a Sunday school teacher that was talking to her class. And she asked the Sunday school class, what is Christmas? And by that, she was saying, what is what is Christmas? And she clarified it and she said, what, what time does it mean? You know, what, what is it for? What's this Christmas time? And she got the usual answers. It's Jesus' birthday. It's a time of joy. It's a time to worship God. But then there was a little boy that raised his hand and he gave a really odd answer. And he said, it's a time for good sportsmanship. And she looked at the little boy and said, well, why is it a time for that? And he said, well, because you don't always get everything you want. <laughs> All right. Now, his idea of Christmas is kind of what we're going to talk about this morning and this evening. We're going to today cover one aspect of Christmas and the next Sunday cover another one in the next Sunday. Different uh, principles that kind of come out from Christmas. And one principle that comes out from Christmas Christmas, and it's that it's kind of an underlying, but I think you're going to see that the Bible bears it out. And that is the idea of Christmas when we think about it coming from God is that it should develop in us as a Christian a giving spirit, not a getting spirit, but a giving spirit. Some folks at Christmas time, it's what am I getting? And most of us, we, we start thinking about that. Hey, what am I getting? And we try to push it out. And as little kids, we say, hey, it's not all about that. But you still seem to give a little more and a little more. And there is something inside of us that is thinking, hey, well, I need that. I'm hoping I'm getting that for Christmas. I'm hoping that this morning and tonight specifically, we're going to look at this idea of Christmas giving. And in Matthew chapter 2, this is the story of the wise men coming to find Jesus. And most in studying it know about the story of the wise men. And in verse 10, it says, and when they saw the star, this is the wise men, they were they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And verse 11 is kind of our, our springboard text. It says, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And notice what their worship entailed, and entailed giving. And that's what I think some of us don't understand, is that giving is a part of worship. When the offering plate goes by, some of our worship is not just singing. Most people just associate singing with worship. We studied that, I think, back in March, and we studied a whole day just on the concept of worship. And worship is prayer, actually. It's singing, yes, but it is our offerings. And if you study the idea of worship biblically, normally there is no worship in the Bible without a little bit of sacrifice. It's always tied together. And so here you see the wise men, and they want to worship, so guess what they do in their worship? When they had open their treasures. They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. As Christians today, we get to celebrate Christmas, but as Christians, we are able to do so because somebody gave of themselves for a way of salvation. We are Christians today because someone gave them themselves to share with us the glorious message of salvation. We can rejoice over the fact that there are those who do not, um, maybe they don't uh, treat the gospel as a, a private uh, treasure, but we rejoice because we have this gospel and we it's a treasure to us. And we can rejoice at Christmas time when it brings back in mind the, the blessedness of a Savior that came down. The shepherds went forth from the stable with a story to tell. The wise men came bringing rich gifts of their substance and returned to the land communicating the good news. The apostles gave themselves without reservation to share the good news. The early disciples went everywhere giving the gospel. So why have we not figured out 
that Christmas is not about getting, but about giving. It's the sa- a story of a Savior who unselfishly gave. For some, Christmas means Santa Claus. Some, Christmas means a Christmas tree and presents. For some, Christmas is a time for visiting relatives and eating delicious food. Some, Christmas is a time of escape. And what do we mean by that? It's an it's escape from reality. They use, um, they increase their use of alcohol and drugs. And you'd say, wait a minute, that's not true. But if you look it up, and this was just a few years ago when I looked it up, but the week of Christmas, there is more alcohol bought, sold, and consumed than any other week of the year in America. Now think about this. Here we're celebrating Christ. I mean, it's almost in the word Christmas. We're celebrating Christ. And because we do such a bad job of giving out the message of Christmas, folks just go in despair. And not understanding the true meaning of Christmas will send you into despair. To some, Christmas is a time of communication between friends. It's cards and letters exchanged. But today, all day today, I want to consider one aspect of Christmas. And that is, Christmas is giving, not getting. Christmas is giving, not getting. I'd like to consider whether we have a giving spirit or a selfish spirit. Because Christ, understanding the true meaning of Christmas, means that I will not be all worried about what I'm getting but I will be concerned about giving. And it's not just giving to my relatives. It's understanding that first and foremost, I give to God. And that means, oh yes, my pocketbook, but it means something else too. It means my life is his. And this morning as we close, I'm going to challenge some of you may have walked in and you do not understand that Christ came and he died on Calvary for your soul. Then what better time than to get saved than at Christmas, when you really, truly will understand the meaning of Christmas, and that is that Christ made a way for you to have your eternity set. You won't have to worry anymore. You won't have to question anymore. It can be set. It can be eternally set. And maybe this Christmas, I don't get everything I want, but guess what? Christ can give, give you everything you need. And that is a way of escape from damnation, from hell. And my prayer is this morning that we can look at some of this. And as un- maybe you came in here and you're not saved, you may not know what that term is, and we'll try to explain that. But if you're not saved, then I pray that God will convict you during the message and show you that you need saved. But then as Christians here today, as we start thinking about this morning and then finish tonight, Maybe it is that you, as even an older person, yes, you're thinking about Christmas as giving, but you haven't really thought it in perspective of God. It's giving gifts to everybody else, and, oh, you know what? Yeah, I need to give God a little token thing. But you wouldn't even be able to celebrate Christmas. We wouldn't be able to even say the word if Christ didn't come. And it amazes me that even as Christians in America, we get so caught up in the materialism and the hype of the, of the wrapping gifts. And I'm not saying that the gift giving isn't, isn't something we should do. I, I like doing that. But that's not what it's all about. It's not about each other. It's not just about getting together and feeling loved and having this fuzzy feeling. Sorry, no. Christmas is about understanding that God gave his son to die for my sins. And without that, I'd be doomed. I'd be forever lost. That's what Christmas is about. It's about giving and having Christ in perspective at Christmas. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we just look at a couple of thoughts this morning, simply help us to look at these scriptures and understand that Christ is the true meaning of Christmas. Lord, help us to understand that we should not have a selfish spirit, but a giving spirit. Bless this morning as always do that which I can't, and that is speak to hearts. 
Well, thank you for that and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go to the Old Testament first. It's Isaiah. Isaiah. You may not know where Isaiah is, but hopefully someone near you is there. And we're just going to read one verse in Isaiah, and then we'll get to Matthew again. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 9. And verse 6, a well-known verse because it has a list of names for Christ. But in the verse, before the names are given of Christ, notice what it says in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Notice the next phrase. Unto us a son is what? Given. There it is. It's a gift. Christmas is about a gift Given So unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called. And these are all uh, unbelievable names for Christ. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then we go to Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, we were there in Matthew 2, so we go just a little bit earlier in Matthew chapter 1. Notice in verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Notice why he was called Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's the gift. The gift, the son is given. A child is born. So why was this son given? Because it's Jesus. And what is Jesus? Jesus can save people from their sins. That's the gift that was given to us. Now in verse 22, now all this was done and it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child. She shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name. Notice Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So what is the gift that was given to us? A son is given. Who is that? Jesus. Because he's the only one that can save people from their sins. And then his name's going to be called Emmanuel. And what is that? God coming and dwelling with us. That is a gift that was given to us. Then we read the passage in Matthew 2, where the wise men come and what do they do? They bring gifts and they gave those. That was uh, found in Matthew 2. So let's go to another passage that is thought of at Christmas time, and that's Luke chapter 2. Many times people read this whole passage. I would recommend it to you. Reading Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 2, I think you would enjoy it. But in Luke chapter 2, this is the story of the shepherds. And the shepherds come and uh, in verse, in verse 13, in verse uh, 11, it's all uh, talking about it. And there's angels that come and are talking, but it's, we'll pick up in verse 14. And in verse 14, here are the angels talking to the shepherds. And they're singing here in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. And, and some people misconstrue uh, that because they think that, and even the disciples Remember, when they were talking to Jesus, they thought that Jesus was going to establish a kingdom right then and take over the Roman Empire. That's not the peace, goodwill towards men that he's talking about. You know, the Bible says that we can have peace with God. That's the peace that it's talking about. There is, there is a separation, and the separation happened at the, be, at the beginning in the book of Genesis when man decided to do his own thing because he listened to Satan and the serpent instead of following God, and because that, there was a separation. What was the separation? Man chose sin, and God is holy. And so man made the choice, and because we are in the Adam line... Every one of us is born as a sinner. We're in, we're estranged from God, right? We're estranged. There is no peace between us and God. So how can we have peace? Well, 
Look what the angels praising, saying, hey, now there's peace, goodwill towards men. It doesn't mean that we all sit around and we hold hands, the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans, and we're all singing kumbaya with our weapons uh, laid down, and they're all unlocked, and we're like, oh. Like, one, no. All right, when I'm not going to hold hands with some Russian guy. No, that's one. All right. And uh, then I look over here with the North Koreans and all that. And they got a they got a shiv coming out into my back while we're ah, and he's all right right there. No, no, no. It's not some kumbaya feeling that we're talking about. And all of our weapons of war. Done. No, actually, we were estranged from God because of sin. And now I can have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's found in Scripture. All right? The Bible says even in Ephesians that we were afar off, but we are able to come nigh because of the blood of Christ. See, the peace that he's, they're singing about is Jesus here on this earth. And that, I was estranged, I was in separation. But because of Christ, because of what he did, I can have peace with God. But that peace did come at a price. It was Jesus dying. It wasn't free. It came at a price. That's why at Christmas, when I think about um, a babe being born... There's more to it than just a simple manger thing, uh, scene. It's thinking about what that babe being born meant for you and I. He was going to grow up and someday die on a cross and he would live a sinless, perfect life and die on the cross for you and I. And he brought peace. Peace is available. Through Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says in verse 15. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another. What are they, what are they saying? Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord had made known unto us. And they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And notice verse 17. This is my point again as far as this idea of giving. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning their child, this child. What was their idea when they saw Jesus? We've got to let people know about this gift. We can't keep this to ourselves. This is something amazing. It's giving. One of the ways we give is by sharing with others the good news of Christmas. That's one of the things that we should be doing. So that's in Luke chapter 2, a well-known verse, and we can say it together. All right, if you need to turn there, I'll give you a moment. But John 3, 16, but I'm going to include verse 17 also. So we most of us know John 3, 16. If you need to turn there, get there quickly, because let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But listen to verse 17. For God sent not his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So what did God do? Again, here's Christmas. It's a gift. It's giving. We see it in Isaiah chapter 9. Guess what? Unto, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We see it in Matthew chapter 1, because what was given? Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the one that can take our sins away. He can save people from their sins. But then in Matthew chapter 2, the wise men came and they worshiped. They found Jesus. And what was their reaction? They worshiped and they gave. 
In Luke chapter 2, the shepherds came and they see a chorus of angels that are crying out saying, now there is peace between heaven and earth, between man and God, the peace, because of Jesus Christ, this babe, this child. And they said, man, we've got to do something. We've got to share it with others. And then in John chapter 3, we're reminded again that God loved this world so much that he gave. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In Philippians chapter 2, once again, we're reminded that the idea of Christmas comes across and that we're willing to give of ourselves. Giving is a principle of Christmas. It's not getting, it's giving. There are three things that I want to think about with this idea of the spirit of Christmas giving. And Philippians, so let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. If you could turn to Philippians chapter 4. And I just have three thoughts that I want to share. And they'll probably be pretty quick. But it's just this idea of Christmas, this, this idea, the spirit of Christmas giving. And Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Notice what it says here. This is Paul writing to a real church, the church of Philippi. Notice what he says in verse 14 or in verse 13, a well-known verse. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Verse 14, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Notice in verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, for even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. I have three simple thoughts about the Bible and the spirit of Christmas giving. The spirit of Christmas giving enables me to partner with other people and help them in need. Do you see what happened in the book of Philippians? Paul was having a need. And I was able by giving, or they were able by giving to help Paul, and nobody else was able to help, but they were able to help. And that's one of my challenges to us. That's why I'm even uh, showing you what we're trying to use even our Christmas offering for. Why? Because we can partner together and we can help somebody else out. That's one of the things that we can do by joining together as a church and giving. The spirit of Christmas giving gives us the privilege of partnering with God's servant around the nation and around the world. So here's a church down in Louisville, and they're just starting up. They've basically been going maybe 10 weeks, maybe 11 weeks. They don't have a lot of funds. They don't have a lot of resources. But guess what we can do? We can send them an encouragement. And we can say, hey, we're here. We'll hold you up financially. We'll hold you up in prayer. That's why we put the list out there. Right, we're, we're also, and hopefully maybe next week I can get just a, a little clip and show you, but we're trying to raise a little money uh, for that church out in Chula Vista. In Chula Vista, they're trying to get some money together because they're in a building and they need to put a down payment on that building and it seems outrageous, it seems overwhelming, but I'd like to just send them a little bit. We can't do it all, but send something to them and say, hey, there's another place trying to help you. That's one of the things that we can do. That's one of the ideas as far as giving. One of the, the, the spirit of Christmas giving gives us the privilege of partnering with God's servants around the nation. The Philippian church was able to do uh, this because of giving. They were able to encourage the heart of a faithful man of God. And we can do that at Christmas through a Christmas offering. We can do that through our weekly tithes and offerings. 
right? Why do I give my weekly tithes and offerings? Why do I put that in the offering plate? Why do I send that in? Why do I do these things? Because as a church, we bind together and we're able to encourage other people. We're able to help a, a church in Mexico. We're able to help a, a church in Cambodia or a church. Remember, we're, we were raising some funds for Mongolia for them to set up a new building. That's what we can do. We can partner together. That's the spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas giving gives us the privilege of partnering with God's servants. The second thing is found in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, a well-known passage on giving starts in verse 8. Ask a question, will a man rob God? And some of us would say, no, nobody would rob God. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And notice what he says. It's two words, not one. We always think of it as the one. And notice it's both. In tithes and what? Offering, and I know this is Old Testament. I understand that. But those, uh, those that claim that the Old Testament, you know what, that's, that's giving in the Old Testament, that's uh, tithing, and there's, there's a whole big debate about tithing and all that, uh, that it's just Old Testament. But what I want them to do is rip out the Old Testament because they better not go there when somebody dies and they're reading Psalm 23. Because they sure enjoy a lot of the Old Testament when uh, when it applies, when they like it to apply to themselves, but when it goes maybe into their pocketbook or it goes into some convicting area of their life, then they're like, whoa, wait a minute. We got to come up with some explanation to get rid of this idea, concept of giving to God. God says people robbed, not just by tithing, but by offerings too. It's not just, uh, I can't just appease God with my 10%. God says, you need to be looking at tithes and offering and saying, God, what, what do you want me to do? And the spirit of Christmas giving, notice what it says in verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. But look at verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and then prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What is the, the Bible telling us? The spirit of Christmas giving gives me the privilege of partnering and helping other people like other churches around the nation, other people around the world. That's what I can do. In my Christmas offering, we try to do that, but also just in my regular tithes and offering. But then the spirit of Christmas giving places me in a position to receive the blessing of God. Now, I don't believe in the, in the what a prosperity gospel. Right, there are some people that say that if, if you give a certain amount, you'll never have any problems. Okay. I think all of, especially those of us that have been saved for a number of years, we're like, eh, no, <laughs> okay. Now, this is what I know, though, okay? I might go through some tough times because I think they're mixing things up. In the Bible, all right, my, my giving is over here, and then there's, there's trials and tribulation. There is trials and tribulations that come through our life. But when I'm right with God, and some of that occurs in my, in my giving, there's other areas that I need to be right with God in. And God has a way of bringing things into our life to help us over and over to get the right, to get his perspective in our life. But I'm right in my giving, and a trial and tribulation comes in. I believe that I'm in a place that I can go to God and say, all right, God, 
This is coming into my life. There's a problem. You show me. Is this because there's sin in my life? Do I need to get something out? But sometimes God says, no, I'm doing this to strengthen you. But I can, because of my giving being right, I have the confidence to step in in a right spirit to God and say, God, I've been faithful here. I've been right here. But guess what happens when a trial and tribulation comes and I know that I have been given like I should? Automatically, I'm like, eh, eh. you know why he's doing that? Because God just wants to get his. He wants to get his, he, get his money out of me. It's a bad spirit, isn't it? And, and all of us have gone through stages where our giving, we became selfish, we became self-centered, and we didn't want to give like we should. And then all of a sudden, a trial and tribulation does come in, and automatically, guess what you say? Just what I do. Yeah, you know what? God's trying to get it out of me. Actually, a trial and tribulation sometimes come in your life. And maybe he's bringing it in just to get your attitude straightened out again. Because you're off. You're out of you're out of sorts. I don't give. I don't give so that I don't have to go to the hospital. Because I know folks that have gone that have given a lot and they went to the hospital. I give because I just flat out love the Lord. That's where you got to get to. And I want to obey him. But giving does bring God's blessing on your life. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get a bigger house. That's not always what God's blessing. I think all of us live around folks or we've met with folks or we know folks that have everything financially they want or need and they're not happy. So it's not necessarily the windows of heaven doesn't mean that the windows open up and all of a sudden you're walking down to your house or you're walking like for me, I live right down the road and I figure, you know, I'm just going to walk down the church and I'm walking. I've done really good about giving. And all of a sudden it's like, boom, something hits me on the head. I'm like, whoa. And I hear clink, clink. And I look down and it's gold. And I, I take another step and ping, clink, clink. And all of a sudden, the windows of heaven are showering gold nuggets. Nah. Mm -mm. Now, if that happens to you, call me, all right? Because I really want to be there to help you pick it up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden I'm giving and my bank account gets larger. Nah, that's not what it's saying. But what it's saying is that God promises when I do right with my giving, he promises to take care of your needs. Not your wants, your needs. And I can hold to that by faith. And when I'm giving properly, and let's say that a trial does come into my life. Let's say that I walk in and the doctor does say cancer. And I know my giving is right. I know that other areas of my life are right. I rest in him. And I say, God, I know I can trust you. I, I know I can trust him because God blesses the giver. In Luke chapter six, this is what the Bible. So remember in Malachi, we're in Malachi chapter three. So that's Old Testament. So the, the, does the Bible in the New Testament kind of give that principle? Yes, it does. And Luke chapter six and verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I am not saying again that giving will make you wealthy. But what I'm saying is there is a benefit of understanding the spirit of Christmas giving. And that is you are you are making it possible for God to bless you. My last point is found in Luke chapter 16. A very well-known passage in Luke chapter 16. And we'll close with this in Luke 16. So what were we trying to do? We write a bunch of passages at the beginning, trying to understand that Christmas, the idea of Christmas, one of the principles that comes out is that it's giving and not getting. 
So financially, what does that mean for me? Financially, it means that we can partner. When I understand the true spirit of Christmas giving, I can partner with others in our church and we can help other people and we can be an encouragement to them. But then also, I not only partner with other people, but I position myself to receive God's blessing according to Malachi 3 and Luke chapter 6. But then in Luke chapter 16, the spirit of Christmas giving makes it possible for me to get the right priority about eternity. What is it? Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And this is verse 23 as the rich man, not the, not the beggar. And the rich man, in verse 23, and the rich man in hell lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, wait a minute, Father, Merc Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And notice what he says. But Abraham said in verse 25, son, remember that in thy lifetime, receives thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted what is what is one of the points of this one of the points of this story is that there is an eternal perspective and at christmas time it reminds me of that when i remember christ there's an eternal perspective it's not about waiting in line on Black Friday. Oh, I gotta get there. I mean, you've probably seen the pictures and there's always fights. You know that, right? There's always fights on Black Friday. There's always been like, ah, that was for my son. Wow. Merry Christmas. Hope he enjoys it. If he's anything like you, I hope he doesn't get that gift, you know what I'm saying? That gift of Christmas, maybe the gift of Christmas would be not to be like you. Because that's what it, I mean, here, and if, and really, if your son or daughter doesn't get that gift, I mean, it's all over? What are you teaching them? What are you teaching your children? I mean, really, I have to end up, at, at 40 years old, I'm going to look back at when I was six and say, man, my, my parents didn't get me that. Well, hopefully somebody will beat the side of me at 40 because that's not what Christmas is about. It's not about what I get. It's a spirit of giving, and it's not just about giving to each other. It's about that Jesus Christ gave his only begotten, or God gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on a cross. And that, and that was not just so that I could sit around a Christmas tree and unwrap presents and do a stocking. I don't mind that. I, you know, I like some of the traditions. I, we, we got Christmas trees everywhere. I like that. I like Christmas season. But it's not about the gifts that we give to each other. It's about Christ. There's an eternal perspective. And I challenge you this morning. Are you forgetting that there's an eternal perspective? And so when I give to the Christmas offering, and we're able to help a church down in Louisville, and we're able to help maybe a, hopefully a church in Chula Vista, and we're able to help some of these other uh, places that we're trying to do, uh, some of the other things that we're trying to raise some funds for. When we're doing some of those things, am I remembering that, man, that money, it might, they might have to take it and use it practically to rent a facility. They might have to take it and use it practically to pay some light bills or things like that. But that 
place, that facility, or that person is going to be able to go out and reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the gospel that we basically are preaching at Christmas, where we start understanding that the Christ of Christmas came and he died later on a cross so that we all could be saved. There's an eternal perspective. The rich man had it all right now. He had it all. Every day he fared sumptuously. Now, once again, only Dr. Mitchell uses those terms. Most of us reading it are like, so what does fared sumptuously? And so Dr. Mitchell would come up, and I'm sure at dinner time, when his kids are around their large mammoth table, and his wife brings out the vittles, which they would not use that term. And it's all spread out there. And he's like, children, let us all join hands. And let us bow for the bounty that is before us. And then after we ask the blessing, let us fare sumptuously. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? What it means is there's a whole bunch of grub that's really good. And we're going to throw down. All right. That's kind of what it means. What it means is he was throwing down every day. Every day there was a throw down. Everything you wanted. But guess what? There's a day coming when this life doesn't matter anymore. There's an eternal aspect. And the spirit of Christmas giving helps me to see past right here, way beyond, and that there's eternal perspective. So are you seeing that? Are you seeing that there is an eternal aspect to our giving? I shared this with the men. I was with Don Fly on Friday morning. And I said, hey, Don. I said, what? What's God been dealing with you? And I said, I know God's always talking to you and dealing with you. I said, so I'd like to share something with our men. And we got talking about different things. And he said, hey, you know, what I've learned is that there's an eternity. It's just been really evident to me. I'm not going to be here forever. He said, but I'm ready. He said, but there's an eternal aspect of, of life and we forget about that and I thought of a verse and I shared it last night with the men in James 4 it says for whereas you know what you know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away many were asking because I was gone last Sunday and it's been I think over 20 years since I've been back to where I grew up, Cleveland. I grew up at Cleveland Baptist Church. And it's been well over 20 something years since I've been there on a weekend. And they asked if I would come and spend a day with them and preach for them. This is the church's 60th anniversary. And being back there made me feel very old. All right, there's uh, there's a lot of folks that I was like, hey, so what about so-and-so? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they died like 15 years ago. I'm like, oh. All right, and then they had one lady. I was getting ready to teach a Sunday school class to some of the couples. I was getting ready to teach a Sunday school class and getting some stuff ready. And this lady came by and uh, uh, the pastor came up and said, oh, here's so-and-so. I'm like, hey, how you doing? She goes, who are you? I was like, oh, I'm so-and-so. I grew up here. It's like, Really? And, and he said, oh, um, she heads up our nurseries. I said, oh. And she looked and she goes, you know, I've been, I've been here for 18 years. And I said, well, it's been at least 20 since I've been here in one of the services. So we don't even know each other. We have no idea. And yet I grew up there and she's been a member there basically for 18 years. Yeah, it makes you old, feel really old. But some of it is our life is a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So what does 
Like the, this, the idea of Christmas giving, what it does is when I think about Christ, what he was able to do is give a gift that doesn't last 10 years. He gave a gift that is still giving 2,000 years later. So I ask you then this morning to consider what you're giving. And some of the things that you're investing your money in, is it going to just stop like January 1st? It's done. It goes out the door and you think and you're like, well, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't bring a lot of satisfaction. Instead, I'm not, again, I'm not knocking stockings and the Christmas gifts. I enjoy doing some of those things. But maybe take a second look and pray a little bit before you just pour a whole bunch of money into something that is not going to bring a lot of satisfaction. Instead, let's ask God to give us as Christians a right spirit of Christmas giving so that it is Christ-centered and not self-centered. And then this morning, it may be that you're here and you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can get a gift this morning by accepting Jesus Christ as your, as, as your Savior, and it's a free gift. Now, by free, it didn't cost nothing. It cost God almost everything. It cost him his son. And Jesus Christ died, and that gift is available for you. It's the gift of God. The gift of God. And it's through Jesus Christ that we can have salvation. And this morning, you may not know Jesus as your Savior. Then I would say, why don't you reach out and take that gift this morning? It's an eternal gift. It will not be done next year. It will not be done in 10 years. It will not be done in 20 years. There's no expiration date on this gift. It's eternal. And you can trust Jesus this morning. But it could be that God's working on your heart as a Christian this morning, and your attitude of giving has been kind of selfish. And you need to change that.